this is a tour de force, to say the least, um, Jonathan. So kudos um, that have been repeated all across the journalistic spectrum, all across the spectrum of anyone who cares about what's happening in this country today. But of the many, many things that you were able to extract from the president in this interview, the one that I think so many people are talking about, and I, I want to know what went through your mind when you heard it, is what I just said. It is what it is. Well, it was a moment where I was trying to actually get the president to grapple with the reality that America, when you compare it to other advanced countries on the measure of death from this virus as a proportion of population, America does very badly indeed. It's not the worst in the world, but it's not far off. And there's a very basic question, which is why is it that the United States of America, with all of its wealth, with all of its resources, with all of its scientific and technological advancement, finds itself in this terrible position? And in, instead of grappling with that question, the president uh, had brought along his own charts to basically try to sell the story that it wasn't as bad as it seemed, that it was under control, and that, in fact, it was a much rosier picture uh, than the raw statistics paint. So it was a very striking part of the interview. And people can judge for themselves whether they think the president, even though he was armed with those charts, had had control over what the information was that they contained or understood it. But I thought there was another point, and and you made it so clearly and so definitively, and that I think is so important as we continue to watch the number of deaths and the number of cases rise, and that is explaining to the president how much a, a large portion of this country, even though it's not a majority, but a large portion of this country still believe him, a large portion of this country that don't believe his lies are lies, who are listening to him for guidance, who are listening to him because they believe he is telling them the truth. And, and then to watch, it wasn't even so much what he said, but his physical reaction when you confronted him with the truth, Jonathan. Yeah, well, so, so that was um, a section of the interview where I was trying to get him to grapple with the concept of communication from a leader in a public health crisis. When you talk to public health experts, they'll tell you that probably the most important thing a president or a leader can do in a public health crisis is provide the public with accurate, reliable, credible, and consistent information, because obviously behavior is so important, social distancing, wearing masks, all that, uh, all those behaviors are so important in stemming the flow of the virus. And, and I put it to the president that he hadn't done that. And that for month after month, not just in the early days when, you know, pe a lot of people were wrong about this, but, you know, March, April, May, and even in June convening what is still the largest indoor gathering in the United States uh, since the pandemic hit, which was his rally in Tulsa. And my question to him was, why did you do that? But he heard it as me challenging him on his crowd size, which was not what I was doing at all and was quite beside the point. In fact, he went on to say that his crowd was well, much let, let larger than I Let me play that reported. because it was, it's a yeah. really one of the many yeah. great moments in the interview, but we have that. So let's play that exchange with the president. But Tulsa was a very good, Oklahoma was doing very well as a state. It was almost free. It spiked a month later, a month and a half, two months later, but it was a good area. We had a tremendous crowd. We had tremendous response. You couldn't even, it was like an armed camp. You couldn't even get through. You couldn't get anybody in. But I'm, I'm we had 12,000 people. It was incorrectly reported. I think you misunderstand me. I'm criticizing your ability to draw a crowd. Are well, you kidding me? I've covered you for this. five years. You draw massive I'm crowds. You get this. huge ratings. I'm asking about At the public the time, health. And I canceled another one. I had to cancel it. Right. We're going to have a great crowd in New Hampshire. And I canceled it for the same reason. But I mean, that obviously wasn't what he said at the time, which was that to accept responsibility, Jonathan. Well, again, it, it's not again, it's it, it's it's reflective of where his mind is at on the on these on these matters. And there it was primarily about defending the size of his crowd and, and the ratings when 
my question was a, a question about public health and the wisdom of convening the largest indoor gathering on American soil since the pandemic. And, you know, I, I'd been in the Oval Office with him the day before that Tulsa rally and on the record asked him whether he'd recommend masks. And he said he recommend people do whatever they want. So it was really a question about presidential leadership and presidential communication. But I think it was uh, somewhat revealing that uh, that he heard it as me challenging him on his crowd sizes, which I wasn't doing. Let me just ask you quickly, because as you just pointed out in that exchange, you've been covering him for years. As he is three months out, how do you find him? Is he very different than somebody you interviewed just months ago? What was your sense of the president? Donald Trump, you know, I, I don't buy into a lot of the stories that he's changed in some substantial way since uh, since June of 2015. I don't believe he has. I believe he's got the same character traits, the same uh, Donald Trump that we've seen consistently uh, in public life, um, going back much further than that. And it's the same again now. And But what I do see is somebody who um, believes that he has a more energetic base than Joe Biden and that he can win by appealing to that base and revving them up more and more and more heading into November. This is not someone who is trying to do a cross over the aisle type of campaign or reaching out uh, to, you know, Democrats or even, uh, you know, soft Republicans who have abandoned him. This is going to be a turnout election. And you can see that in his public posture. And Jason, I want to bring Claire and Jason in. I was thinking as uh, I learned that you were going to be on the show, I thought, wow, if I was in his position, I would be teaching this interview and, and not to make this all about you, uh, Jonathan <laughs> yeah. Swan, although, again, I can't even say enough about what you did here. But the preparation and again, for me, the reaction of the, this president when he is confronted with the facts. Well, you know, I, I thank you for asking that. One of the things that hit me, honestly, about the effectiveness of, of Jonathan's interview was not just the reactions he got out of the president, but here's the thing. Donald Trump lies so much and so consistently that it's very easy to sort of argue with him, as we saw on Fox, and then you have to go and do a pre-tape edit and go in and say, okay, this is why we know we were lying. What was smart about what Jonathan did is you had the information right there. You could throw the information right at him. And I will also point out this. I teach at a historically black college and university. I really doubt that Donald Trump would have been able to have that kind of conversation if the interviewer was a woman or a person of color, because his mm. hostility level towards being asked questions that we've seen with like your Michelle Sindor and other women, it is much more hostile if he is being questioned by people of color or women. So part of this was also just demographic in addition to being a very, very effective and well-organized interview. Yeah, and I don't know, Claire, how many people are out there who can now be unsure about whether they think this president is a credible purveyor of facts. But if there are minds to be changed, I think, you know, look, we have been in this for months and months and months. And one of the things, again, that Jonathan pressed him about is when rapid tests were going to be available. He couldn't answer that question. He couldn't give a date beyond soon. Now they send out overnight this campaign email telling supporters to wear masks. And this is the quote. I don't love wearing them either. Masks may be good, they may be just okay, or they may be great. They can possibly help us get back to our American way of life. We're in August, and he's writing that masks, Claire, may be good. Yeah, um, you know, I think you need a full two hours for this interview. Seriously, um, you know, I, I, I'm getting worn out a little bit with uh, telling Jonathan how great it was, but it really was revealing. And there was so much in this interview that we haven't even touched on. I mean, here's a law and order president who tries to say that a child sex predator who has just been arrested might be innocent. And he said John Lewis will be remembered for not coming to his swearing in. I mean, there, you know, he never asked Putin about bounties on American soldiers. I mean, there is topic after topic around 30 percent of our population that you've got to wear a mask. And I um, after watching this interview and everyone should, I got one thing to say. I know who should be afraid of debates. And it's not Joe Biden.
Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.